Hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Evers. I'm the executive director with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation, and we're thrilled to have you join us tonight at the Walker to, for our Next Generation of Park Lecture series. Um, the Minneapolis Parks Foundation is an independent nonprofit, and our mission is to transform human life through parks and public spaces by aligning philanthropic investment with community vision. And uh, this series, the Next Generation of Park Series, is part of us delivering this mission. It's really about bringing big ideas forward and, and injecting the community with new ideas and then and starting new conversations. So we're really thrilled to have you here to be part of this, and we hope that this is just uh, one of the pieces of the conversation um, tonight. Um, before I introduce Juxtaposition, Juxtaposition Arts and our, our students uh, and, and Stephanie Curtis and Gia Biagi, I just want to explain a little bit about the Minneapolis Parks Foundation and our work. Um, our role here in Minneapolis is really to help bring vision to implementation. Um, we help this city, which is really a city within a park, to continue to think big. We are really fortunate to live in a city in which for 140 years, we've been living off of a vision that was designed by Horace Cleveland and enacted by uh, citizens and superintendents over many years. And the Parks Foundation is, is here to help keep that vision looking forward to make sure that we're incorporating as many voices into that vision. Um, our signature project that many of you may be uh, aware of in different pieces, and you'll hear a lot about from the juxtaposition students, is River First. And it's a partnership that we have with the park board, with the city, with nonprofits, with the community um, to envision the last stretch of unclaimed park space uh, in the city, which is really from St. Anthony Falls at the Stone Arch Bridge to the northern edge of Minneapolis. Um, even before Horace Cleveland designed, put, laid forward the br blueprint for the city, that was already industrial and rail line. And all of us here know that it's starting to transform already. And it's our, this generation's obligation, our opportunity, our, ben our, 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 our role is really to finish that story, to make sure that the neighborhoods on either side, north and northeast and downtown central, have real connections to those rivers, to the river and those spaces, and that those spaces really benefit those who live there and those who, be, who, who visit. So, um, you know, the projects, you'll hear a little bit about some of them, but the ones that we're working on is Waterworks, which is at the end of the Stone Arch Bridge, um, a, a destination place, a signature location. Um, there's Halls Island, which is further up uh, near Plymouth Avenue, which will be the first uh, public beach on the Mississippi River serving northeast. There's the Great Northern Greenway River Link. So the Great Northern Greenway is a stretch coming from Worth Parkway all the way to uh, northeast where uh, the Gross Golf Course is, um, connecting the city across that way. And for us, we're working right at the juncture of the river where north and northeast come together. And then the Upper Harbor Terminal, which is an exciting opportunity of 50 acres that is being transformed and re-envisioned. But we aren't here to do this alone, and this is why I'm excited to have juxtaposition here. Is we've been working with them this summer to really, and for the past two summers, these amazing students to help us reimagine some spaces, and not just how those spaces are designed, but also how those spaces connect with our lives. How do they transform lives? And then after uh, the juxtas uh, folks speak, we'll get into the presentation with uh, Gio Biagi and, and Stephanie Taylor, uh, Stephanie Curtis. Um, so Juxtaposition Arts uh, is, is a nonprofit youth art education program in North Minneapolis. They are profound, amazing. They are really a gem that is a, a, a national treasure that we have here in the city. Um, and we've been working with these students many over two years and some for the first year to really look at these spaces. And I'm really excited to have introduced Sam Arrow Phillips and his students Tatiana Gross and Elijah Warfield Wright to tell you a little bit about their explora exploration of the space and really how they think about it. And I think you'll really be inspired and tickled and, and impressed and, and all the things about the potential that this city has and their vision has for the city. And I just say that as we move forward, it's really critical that we incorporate the ideas that are coming forward from the youth into how we imagine our city, because they're the ones who will be really enjoying the benefits of that. Um, Following them, uh, Stephanie Curtis with the Minnesota Public with Minnesota Public Radio will introduce our, our guest speaker uh, Gia Biagi, and then host a conversation afterwards. Uh, before I turn it over, I just want to thank the Walker Arts Center for hosting it here. We've had many conversations, and we hope to have many more. This is a, a place of inspiration, um, and Minnesota Public Radio for being a sponsor for being uh, helping us tell this story. 
So without further ado, I would love to introduce Sam and his students and have a chance to share their story. So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. My name is Sam Aroa Phillips. I've been uh, working at Juxta for um, about 10 years. I've been teaching the environmental design program for the last five. Um, so Juxtaposition Arts, if you don't know, just a quick backstory, is an art nonprofit. We've been around for about 22 years. Uh, we focus on having uh, the future leaders of tomorrow get access to design jobs and basically apprentice with uh, actual artists in the different disciplines. So we have four labs where youth can actually be paid to work alongside adult artists to work with real clients and get real skills that will help them in their uh, future academic careers and in the um, work profession. So um, we have a textile design studio where they do t-shirts, a graphic design studio that does logos and design, um, logos and business cards and a wide variety of different things. Um, contemporary art studio, they're at the kind of cutting edge of, you know, what type of art uh, youth should be looking at and they do exhibits and um, some performances, and then the uh, graphic design studio, I'm sorry, I already said that, uh, the environmental design studio. So we work in the realm of architecture, landscape architecture, and urban planning. Um, we work with a wide variety of different clients on different projects. Um, I could tell you a little bit about some of them, but I think I'm gonna let our apprentices tell you about this engagement. And if you haven't had a chance, you should check out the brochure that I worked on with them to document this entire engagement process. Hi, my name's Tatiana Gross. I go to North High School. I've been at Ju uh, sorry at Juxta for a year and a half now. Hi, my name is Lenija Warfield Wright, and I'm 16, and I've been at Juxta for five months, and I go to Pym Arts High School. My experience at Juxta is kind of different from usual person because I row, and I've been rowing for two years, and it's the best experience of my life. The places I have actually rowed on have been on the Mississippi and a lake in St. Anthony. As a part of the community engagement with Minneapolis Jux Park, sorry, Park Foundation, Juxta leads three kayaking trips on the Mississippi River, and we invited youth groups from Project Sweetie Pie, Urban Strategies, and Asian Media Access. Um, when I think about the difference between kayaking and rowing, it's really not one because you just go along the river, you know? But um, the present is different. I, the first time I rolled, I was with my team and it was to practice hard and just work hard and just keep rowing through the whole thing. But actually when I was with my coworkers, it was different. We got to kayak along the Mississippi and look at the Upper Harbor Terminal and we asked questions and it was nice to just be with a group of girls and um, everyone just enjoying life. My first day at Juxta, I went biking and kayaking for six hours, which was amazing. I'm not even gonna lie, it was amazing. And I got to see the river in a new way. I got to see the Upper Harbor Terminal, 26th Avenue. And now that I've been working on it for a year and a half now, I feel like that area has so much potential and so much life that could be there. Before starting at Juxta, I actually didn't know anything about the Upper Harbor Terminal. I didn't know that it existed. I didn't know we were doing projects. I didn't know it was going to be done. I didn't know anything. But the first time I got to go to the Upper Harbor Terminal, I was with a coworker, and we actually were hosting a tour for people who wanted to visit the site. And it was, overall thing was nice because um, I just liked seeing the domes and just being able to, like, walk through and just noticing how, like, if you actually think about it, everything can be changed, and it was just nice being there. I am a part of another um, lab at Juxus called Tactical. We do a lot of community engagement. We've been doing community engagement at Appetite for Change's Block Party. We have done um, engagement at Flow, the Northside Art Crawl, in Open Streets on West Broadway. And we went door knocking in the McKinley area. And we did tours at a park, and we brought people down to the site so we can see what they think. And we've been talking to the um, north side to see what they really want. We've heard so many different things, and but the things that really stood out were something for the youth, something unique, and something that will benefit the north side. That is the north side community that's there now. Um, another project that, well, actually, I've been a lot working with Upper Harbor Terminal, and I think it's nice to know that um, we actually get to talk to a group of people and make decisions to help them with the domes and um, 
just being able to talk to youth teenagers and all my other coworkers and just being able to um sorry um um talk and just you know go through the actual and be on the site to um invite and actually invite people there too we've we've also been working on 26th avenue which connects to farview park and there it connects a neighborhood together and right now it's cold and boring and there's nothing that will make me want to go there <laughs> but and if when you're like standing on the bumpy road you can't see the river and when you're on the river you can't see 26th avenue and I really feel what could be there and what our team feels that could be there is public art, something for the youth and something that can bring life there. And that's all that I got for you guys. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Curtis from Minnesota Public Radio. We're really happy to be partners with the Minneapolis Foundation, Minneapolis Parks Foundation. It was great to hear from the kids working with juxtap juxtaposition arts. Uh, so uh, Gia Biagi works with Studio Gang. It's based in Chicago, and it defines itself as a group that uses design as a medium to connect people socially, experiential, experientially, and intellectually. She's a principal of urban and civic impact there. She and she says it, uh, her, her bio says she leads design teams, coordinates, ma coordinates master plans, facilitates stakeholder engagement, and guides the urban approach for projects. Now, prior to joining Studio Gang, she spent more than a decade working for the city of Chicago as the director of planning and development, and later as the chief of staff for the Chicago Park District. I'm really excited to see her presentation because she's worked on really incredible things. She's uh, worked on projects that unite communities with the police. She's worked on projects that unite Chicago with forgotten parks or added on to parks that are already seen as a huge success. And she's worked on trying to convince, it's, believe it or not, it's hard, sometimes hard to convince people that there should be a park in their neighborhood. Uh, some people want a dog park, some people don't. She's fought those battles. And it's not always just giving people presentations saying, here's a great park. There's a lot of negotiating that goes into it, and she can tell us more about it. And she spent time also in something that's dear to my heart because my family in Memphis, and she's working on a project right now that's reintroducing, that's working to make sure, connecting me Memphis to the river that they have in their backyard. That's the same river that we have in our backyard that the Parks Foundation is working so hard to make even a better place for everyone in Minneapolis, the Mississippi, and that great American river. So... Gia Biagi is going to come up here and give a presentation. Afterwards, I'm going to be talking to her, but you're going to be talking to her too. So if there are questions that come to mind while she's talking, uh, make a note of them, write them down or whatever, and uh, we're going to be interviewing her afterwards, all of us together. All right? Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Thanks for coming out on a Thursday night. Uh, so th this is uh, Next Generation of Parks, and you're looking at them right in the front row, right? The folks that you're, kids that you heard from and the work that they're doing, that's about the next generation, I think, of folks who will really have a civic impact on not only Minneapolis, but I think the world at large. So you heard a little bit about me, um, and I have a habit probably of wandering, but I know the microphone's here, so if you see me try to get out of my cage, that's why I'm here. Uh, so uh, I work for Studio Gang, and I lead a practice there called Urbanism and Civic Impact. So Studio Gang is this uh, collective of architects and artists and urban planners and urban designers and writers, uh, but we're most known for our architecture that's super tall. So uh, the picture of the Aqua Tower I think you have in, in the middle there um, is an example of some of the work that we're most noted for, which is playing with kind of the undulation of the facade of a building and really thinking about what the consequences are, good consequences of when you create balconies where you can actually see your neighbor uh, on them and you create this sort of social capacity on the facade. And that kind of idea of how we build relationships and how we get connections and what design might have to do with that is a big part of our practice. So um, while most of it, as I said, is focused on kind of architecture architecture and that one foot level of work, um, my role is to look at the whole city and whole neighborhoods and say, you know, what are these systems and forces that press upon the places for architecture? What are the forces that press back? So thinking about not just land use and transportation, but economics and even human relationships and how do we build better communities together? So let's see, this clicker's a little slow. Ah, 10 minutes. So I have a little more than 10 minutes to talk to you, but 
Uh, the other hat that I've worn is this city hat, right? So I'm a recovering city official. I worked for the city of Chicago for about 16 years. Uh, I spent a lot of time as director of planning and development there, many years, a lot of scars. Uh, and I also uh, was chief of staff. So I had the opportunity to kind of look at the broad view of, you know, what design choices we make, how we engage with communities. Uh, but then sort of getting at that chief of staff level was thinking about strategy and policy and how that relates to budgeting, which if you don't know what an organization cares about, look at their budget, that's what they care about, and then how that connects to performance. Are we doing what we said we'd do? Did the policy make it all the way through the budgeting? And then how do we do and how does that inform what we do next? So a lot of that role was sort of taking on these policy questions, and one was the 10 minutes, which any uh, park professionals know, think what they know what I'm talking about, 10 minutes in parks? Oh, come on, it's Minneapolis, the 10 minute walk to a park, right? So this was a huge policy initiative that actually was promulgated by folks uh, at the Trust for Public Land and other park advocates. Uh, in fact, we have an old timer from the Trust for Public Land, and our friend from the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. Uh, and if you don't know the Trust for Public Land, they're worth knowing. They, they not only help organize communities, they finance parks, they'll do fundraising, all kinds of things. And they're one of those good partners that you need to get things done. And uh, in parks, I say like TPL is like the Kevin Bacon of the parks world. There's like six degrees of separation between parks and TPL. So if you know the Kevin Bacon jokes, you'll get that. Anyhow, so this 10 minutes, right? So I'm chief of staff and, you know, we're like, how do you get to the gold standard, which is every resident being in a 10 minute walk from a park? It's really hard to get to. Well, Chicago at the time when I was there, we were at 94% of residents were a 10 minute walk to a park. And that sounds great, right? Uh, until you get a new mayor who's like, what, what, what about that last 6%? 10 minutes, make it seven, make it seven. And we're like, no, Mr. Emanuel, you cannot make a seven minute walk to a park. That's a park every two blocks, it's impossible. And so that impossible task was a lot about sort of where people settled and, and movement patterns. And the fact is a lot of our areas that deindustrialized in the city were now populated by people. And so whose house are you gonna tell me to tear down to build that park, right? No one's. And so the idea here was how do we interpret this policy and do it in a way that thinks differently about the assets around us, what we could invest in that expands our park, net, park network, and to be thinking about sort of how we build connections between where people are and where they wanna be. And that maybe time is more important than distance as we think about that. So this project you see behind me is the 606 Bloomingdale Trail. It is in Chicago. It's a three mile long elevated rail to trail project that connects uh, many acres of parks and built out six new ones in a west side, set of west side communities. Uh, if you've heard of the High Line in New York, maybe some of you have heard of, uh, this is bigger, it's better, it's longer, it costs less, and you can ride your bike on it. So we all have our linear park systems, right? And so this was one that uh, really came out of the engagement process, which was we had the policy problem, and uh, we you know, in our, we have our government hats on, and we have no idea exactly what we're going to do other than to start mapping and figure out where's land and what can we use. Uh, but the best thing we ever did was to walk to, out to the community, uh, the folks who were in areas that had been designated as underserved, not enough acres per thousand residents, and they said, this isn't that hard. You see that rail line up there? It's been up there forever. There's one train a month. We're up there already. It functions like a park. Can you invest in it? And that started really what was 10 years of conversation that uh, a, the new mayor coming in was a really catalyst toward pushing forward. And so I, I put this on the table for a couple of reasons. One is that if we only thought about how far people were from this system, we'd never get to that 10 minute walk. It's just impossible. But what we're able to do is get people on one end of that system and because there's very little friction once they're on that system to where they want to go, and even being on that system is part of the journey, then I've achieved that 10 minutes. So I don't care if you go a half mile or a mile or two miles, but if I can get you to a park system in 10 minutes, then we've done something. And that's something that those sort of uh, gold standards don't really count. And I think we're getting to a point where we're starting to achieve these standards for parks, and the question is, what do you do next? If we think about, for example, here in Minneapolis, do you know your percentage? 97% of residents are within a 10 minute walk of a park. And the only other city who's better than that is San Francisco, where 100% of San Franciscans are a 10 minute walk from a park. Well, that's great. San Francisco's great. Who can afford to live there, <laughs> right? So no, no snub to my friend Phil Ginsburg who runs the park system out there. But the fact is the key public policy question for San Francisco is not access to parkland necessarily. It's not about enough parkland necessarily, but it is about affordable housing. 
And so we're at a moment, and I see this in work across the country, where we need to think differently about the assets that we do have. Maybe we do have parks and what works well in those systems and how those translate to really moving the needle on those key public policy questions we're trying to face as a city. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I, our practice in part is called civic impact because we're asking those questions, particularly because in every city where we are, we're more and more segregated in a number of ways, particularly by income. That's what you see in San Francisco over the past 40 years. People are not living together. They're not living in an economically integrated way. And that has plenty to do, to of influence over economic growth, over well-being, over quality of life. Uh, we mistrust each other more than ever. These are studies out of the City Observatory. They're a think tank out of New York. They do some really great reports. They also do a lot of studies about gentrification. We trust each other less. In the 70s, yeah, about half of Americans say, yeah, you can pretty much, much trust other people. And now, and as of uh, 2009, we were down to about 30% of Americans thought, well, maybe you can trust most people. And I have no idea where we're at now, but I'm guessing it went uh, in the wrong direction. And so what I'm putting on the table here, though, is as we start to think about what we can do with the assets that we have, whether it's parks and open space, whether it's a library, whether it's a sidewalk, that we own things in common that actually we can influence with design, which I'll talk a little bit about here, that can move the needle on those questions of how we relate to one another. How do we build connections to our communities and to each other that make for stronger neighborhoods? And so these are some great stats that come out of a couple of different sources, but a notable one is uh, the Knight Foundation and Gallup Poll's Soul of the Community Study. And so what they did was they, they had 43,000 responses to their surveys and interviews across 26 cities. And we're asking questions about what it means to feel connected to your community, so you might stay in it, and is the relationship to things like economic growth, and they're finding that there are correlations. And so what about what makes people feel connected to their community, right? It's levels of trust with your neighbors. It's having great public spaces to be together in. It's, there are all kinds of pieces, and as we're talking about parks today, Parks and recreation are doing many of these things, right? They're doing them where they are. Um, and that this, the influence here is astounding in some cases. People with access to community events are 13% more likely to trust government. What does that mean? What could it mean? That could mean you might actually get up and vote on the day that there's an election because you actually think it will count because you've had a great relationship in a public space at a pu public event and you think, you know what? The government kind of knows what it's doing. You know what? I will participate. Those small things matter. And in particular, for a city that I live in, we are grappling with violence. We are grappling with communities uh, that are experiencing violence, that have uh, relationships with police or no relationship with police that are completely deteriorated. And statistics like people with abundant access to parks being 27% more likely to trust police, well, that sounds great. And that's real deep as a statistic. But I also know that Chicago, Chicagoans, 97% are within a walkable distance of a park. So that's not it alone, right? It's not enough that there's just access to parks, but it matters what we do in them. It matters how we design them. And to the extent that design has a role to play in building relationships, and we think there's a bit of a role there because you're setting up the conditions for these account encounters to happen. As designers, we're curious to say, well, what can we do with the tools that we have to make communities better. And so, for instance, in the Chicago question, and we're working on this kind of topic in some other cities right now, how do you create safe spaces, right? There's only so much. Design is a, a set of tools. It's a mechanism. But all of these other issues have something to do with what makes a block feel safe, what makes a place, what makes there to be neutral spaces on these blocks. And we know health and wellness has a role to play, and youth engagement has a role to play, and environment has a role to play. So what do you do knowing that those factors are maybe outside your wheelhouse if you're in parks and recreation? Maybe it feels like it's outside of your core competency. And what I'm here to talk about is that there are ways to leverage the civic realm in ways that are outside of that competency, that are asking and we need to ask these civic assets and these civic institutions to do more than just what they're used to delivering on a daily basis. If we're going to get at some of these issues of trust, if we're going to improve relationships, and if we're going to build uh, healthier communities. So I'm going to tell you about two projects, uh, Polis Station uh, and Civic Commons. So Polis Station was a project that really came out of an opportunity um, from through the Chicago Architectural Biennial, which is a big exhibition uh, that started a couple of years ago. There's one going on now um, where you could take on just about any question uh, if you were one of the architecture firms chosen to participate. 
And, you know, at Studio Game, kind of went through lots of esoteric kinds of ideas, like uh, what does the bathymetry of the ocean bottom have to do with uranium mining and how could architecture influence it and all this kind of stuff. And eventually you're like, nah, nah, it's not even useful to us in any way. Um, but what we were seeing every day in, in our friends, in our family networks, and what we're seeing in Chicago was that there's, there are broken relationships between police and the, and the people they're supposed to serve. And so we were interested in these questions, though, of what policymakers were doing. And so this is this policy hat that I can't take off, right? It comes from those thinking about those 10-minute walks and thinking about the implications in space for the choices we make when we write it down on a piece of paper after all the research and we think it's the right thing. So. We were very interested in looking at some of the policies associated with uh, President Obama's 21st, our task force on 21st century policing, which was looking at these key policy pillars that they were sending out to local police departments to say, you know what you need to do? You need to build trust and legitimacy. You need to build morale. You need to create relationships, all kinds of things. And in this really thick report, and they did a, a you know, couple years long worth of interviews out in communities, all kinds of thinkers and, and information, but there was nothing that addressed where we interact and what the built environment has to do with that and what we can do with that civic realm to influence relationships if we can. And this is, so we were interested in the question of whether design could do something to help build a little bit of trust. Uh, and so the project began by looking at deeply, starting with architecture because we're architects and saying, well, what is the architecture of policing and what has it been historically? We went back two to three hundred years of policing architecture and policing policies and strategies here and overseas and looking at these threads. And where we got to in the current day in Chicago was at this prototype. Uh, and cities love prototypes, right? They're, you design them once, you drop them in, you know what they cost, you know how to deliver it, everybody knows what they're getting. But the problem with prototypes, especially if that's all you do is prototypes for your police stations, for example, they're completely tone deaf. They drop in on the corner that it fit. They don't think about the community around it. They don't ask the community what would be useful to them in this huge investment into something on their block. Um, and they're, they're relatively, uh, not more relatively, they're, they're built a lot like a, a big box retail, a lot like a Walmart just drops in and is surrounded and sees a parking. That's how it looks uh, in Chicago. And, and there are many other cities that we're working in where we see the same things. So part of our process was to really understand what was driving those choices, right? And ideas about crime prevention through environmental design, cut down all the trees, light things up with spotlights, make it completely uncomfortable to be anywhere in that space, and then it'll be safe. Um, those are the kinds of theories that really drove some of this architecture. But more importantly, we needed to understand from folks who are, in particular, the neighborhood where we're doing work, who were involved with the police station, either through work or it's in their neighborhood or we're in some way touching the systems that are related with policing. And so um, part of our uh, role as designer here uh, was to be a convener and to help get folks to the table who might ordinarily not. And so we were talking with folks on all ends of the spectrum from commanders and sergeants, you can see Sergeant Lara in there, beat cops, folks designated to do community policing out of the police department, which used to be a philosophy, and then it became a department, and then it became a citizen function kind of adjunct to the police department, which says a lot about what happened to community policing, at least in my city. Um, but then also talking to folks on the other end of the spectrum, returning citizens, folks who've been formerly incarcerated, folks who've been beat up by police officers, Black Lives Matter and Black Youth Project 100 folks, people who are doing organizing kind of on both ends of the spectrum and trying to bring folks together um, and really, understanding, look, is there anything that design can do? Design is not going to solve this, but for ourselves, the, the toolkit that we had and then we could put on the table were design tools. And it wasn't about so much figuring out what ought to be designed in the end, but more about using the design process as an opportunity to build those relationships. So if we never built anything, I don't care. Don't tell my boss. I don't care if we never build anything because what we're building is relationships, opportunities for people to get to know each other, and the fact is when designers leave, something else happens. There's a crisis or there's another project and things land on neighborhoods all the time. So if we've done our job at a minimum right, then we've helped build some relationships with the people who are going to stay in that neighborhood and who have the most at stake. And that's the approach and that's how we looked at trying to bring in as big a tent as possible into conversations and doing community cafes and interviews and shred experiences with both uh, police and people who, uh, who were uh, often on the receiving end of police policy into the same room because there's, 
while there's so much heaviness on the table, right, we have to talk about Laquan McDonald. We have to talk about police brutality. There are all these criminal justice. There are all these important things we need to talk about. But what we learned in this process was that when you start with design, you can at least get people talking about the front desk, that it's too high, that it's intimidating. You can get people on all sides of that discussion talking about these simple things of, you know what, that parking lot is too big. Could it be something else? And these small ways in, using design just as a way in, set the table for the possibility of deeper conversations. Not ones that design is going to be any kind of solution for, but design could at least have been this way to move the conversation in that direction. And so in this particular case, this is in North Lawndale where we were working uh, with both the residents, police, aldermen, uh, you can see the kind of Walmart style. It's dropped in there in the middle, and then those seas of parking, like big barriers. And so together, uh, with all of those folks, we reimagine the possibilities that we're saying, what is it that in the investments in a police station have that could benefit the community? Uh, this community has no kind of broadband or Wi-Fi or easy access, but the police station does. Could we leverage that? There's not enough retail. There aren't opportunities to just get simple services that both were an opportunity for po people to have productive encounters in a low stakes way. And so could we make those, those opportunities happen? Could we take advantage of the fact that vacant land is an asset? How do we invest in it in a way that provides the recreation space that everyone was looking for in this community? And so it was an aspirational plan. Uh, and in looking very closely at what are short, medium, and long-term things that we could do with that public facility to open it up. Whoops, that went too fast. But the one thing that folks actually agreed on was this idea of transforming part of the parking lot into a basketball court. Now, I am not saying to run out and do this. Uh, what I'm saying is that because this is a practice, I don't believe in best practices. I, there are best principles and there are good practices. And in this case, this is what the combined effort of being in a design conversation came up with, where there was a collective memory in this neighborhood. Chicago's a basketball town, even if the Bulls aren't any good for a while. But this is also a basketball neighborhood. And the collective memory that people had of this one moment in time where they actually were getting along with the police, and it was when a temporary hoop was put up on the parking lot, and it only happened for a weekend. But years later, people remembered it and said, well, this was something. Can we invest in this? Can we do this together? And so even though it was an aspirational kind of project done for an exhibition and to build some community conversations, uh, we went out and fundraised. And uh, for those of you who work in city government, we basically got the park district to build a court on a police station parking lot uh, that was owned by the Department of General Services, right? So it was some heavy lifting. I think the last of my clout with the city was uh, spent on this. Um, <clears throat> but I'll tell you two things about it. This is just a small thing. This is not... Um, it's a step up from tactical urbanism. I'll say that for those of you in the business of tactical urbanism, and I'd be happy to talk about that more. Um, but it's permanent, and it's in there, and it, this is the day that it opened. Uh, the mayor, waiting for the mayor to come out, and you got the big ribbon and everything, and some of the kids there shooting hoops, they were walking by the police station, and they were walking the long way around, because you know what? A 10-minute walk doesn't matter when you're crossing gang lines to get to the park, so they have to take the 20-minute walk anyway. And they're walking by, and they're like, can we play here? yeah, you could totally play here. This is a community court. And so there was this, this thing about recreation that people in the parks world know. There are these moments where if you make it accessible and it's the right intersection of what people are asking for and close to where they need it, meeting them where they are, these things work. And that's, all, that's like 20 grand, right? So that was the day that it opened. But what I really appreciate is two years later, this is a tweet sent out by the 10th district. Um, that was talking about how it's a community court. It's not their court. They're identifying it as community court. We don't tell them how to talk about it. And they're saying, come on out to the community court, swing by, hashtag building bridges, building trust. And for me, that was a great example of just the endurance of this, that people are still using it. We've gone back and checked, which is another um, thing that designers, young designers too, go back because uh, you, may, you may not like what you see, uh, that what you design that seems so awesome isn't working. Um, but we went back and it is still working. Um, and so, you know, from that, some of the, some, there are lots of lessons that we could take from it, but I think one of the uh, notable ones was that you can think differently, right, about your civic assets and the role that they play. 
right? So I'm coming back around to this idea. Um, notwithstanding the fact, I should say with the one last story with that is uh, the police station got a new commander and uh, all the folks who are involved with the project, they said, uh, oh, this new commander, he comes from the gang unit, he doesn't know our neighborhood, he doesn't, I don't think he even likes basketball, he's probably going to want us to get rid of it, can you guys come in? Uh, and I don't know, do your dog and pony show, maybe you'll convince him. So, uh, so we're like, okay, you know, we'll go in and so we have, you know, here's, here's how it happened and here's where we are and all that. And I don't know, uh, in my experiences meeting uh, with the police, there's lots of silence in these meetings. So you basically say everything, you try to fill the silence and you're empty and you just kind of sit. And so the commander, he's looking down, he's like, can we make it bigger? Could it be a park? Could we have national night out here? Could we do this? Could we do that? So there was an immediate recognition by someone who had nothing to do with the process of the value of it. And so that I think was a good moment and actually a precedent for Chicago, for what's possible if you run a process, hopefully, where people are enabled to ask for and dream about the things that would make a difference to them. We could not have come up with that project on our own. And if we had, it wouldn't have mattered. So as we think about all of our civic assets, the second th pro project that I'll run through fairly quickly here is this idea of a civic commons. So this is a map of Philadelphia, a city that we're doing some work in. And when you look at uh, city maps like this, in blue is everything the public owns in common. That's all your parks, that's your police stations, that's your libraries, it's also your public right-of-ways, it's your sidewalks, it's, it's the parking meter. And when you add all of that up, in cities, it's most in major cities, it's between 30 to 50 percent of the land area is owned in common. That is a lot to leverage, right? And so the question here is that if we have the ability to be in any neighborhood we need to, we have some asset to work with, how could we leverage that so that these civic assets, whether they're parks or libraries or police stations or streets, are more relevant to the communities where they reside? Because Populations move around. These cities' facilities can't, so they need to adapt. They need to be relevant um, because they've, all they've got down is this geography. When I was in the parks, if I could have backed a truck into like half of our buildings, I would have and knocked them over because they were old and they were too expensive and you know they're really hard to keep up. But you can't do that. And buildings don't move. People do. So we have to adapt. And meeting people where they are is part of this. So for this project, which was called the Civic Commons, which was uh, launched by a uh, national coalition of donors, or philanthropists, including um, Knight Foundation, Kresge, Rockefeller, JPB, that was looking at what they could do in cities to leverage that civic asset network. Part of our work was to say, well, they started with parks and libraries. We're adding police stations and streets, that sort of thing. But it doesn't really matter what the facility is, as mu in as much as what are the services being offered, we found. And so this was an example of some gap analysis that we were doing, saying, OK, it's not a, a uh, chart that's saying parks do this, libraries do that, the health services do that. But it's saying, what are the kinds of services being offered? What day of the week are they being offered in? What time of day are they being offered at? And where are there gaps in that network? And in this case, uh, in Southwest Philly, where we're working, what we recognized was that the library, which is a killer library, the Pascoville branch, where they lend ties for people to go on job interviews, which is amazing stuff. Uh, they have the best workforce development training programs. You can come in, get your resume. You can learn all the things you need to know uh, to get a job, except uh, it's only offered uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. So if you have a job and you're looking for upward mobility and you need some training or you need some help, you actually can't go. It's not available to you. But the park down the street is open on evenings and weekends. Can we just make a simple adjustment? And guess what? That park also has a couple of empty club rooms. And so it's a different philosophy. It's getting outside of those borders of the parks um, and thinking more programmatically about staffing the neighborhood. And I'm borrowing that phrase from uh, Catherine Ott-Lovell, who runs the Philly Park System. And that's the way she thinks about it. It's not that I need to have X amount of staff in this building and X amount of staff in that building, but what are the skill sets that are reaching people in terms of needs and aspirations in that community? It's a different way of thinking about how you leverage your assets, your human capital in addition to your physical capital. 
And so much of our work was looking at, from a, a broad point of view, what could you do with these physical assets? How could you open up a library, for example, that has uh, similar architecture to a lot of older park systems as well, a Carnegie Library that has the windows really high because there are only books on the first floor, because whoever thought we wouldn't want books in our libraries, but we have libraries with fewer and fewer books. But it's also a very intimidating building. It's also a polling place. And so the process with them was to start test piloting programming. What can you do that's a validation or not of what folks are saying they'd like to do there? How can we change that apron? And then once we have uh, have a proof of concept, right? So the, the test events, we've tried it out, people want to do this, then we invest in a, a little more rigorous way with more capital, and then over time codify it. And those are the kinds of structured investments that we're seeing in cities, looking, we're seeing that cities are looking for, particularly as you have to put it together partnership with funding. So you need to prove things before they can come to pass. But then you also need to think differently. This library needs to do things other than simply have books. And we know that. Libraries are retooling. But to think about what are the physical components of that, there's a whole toolbox on that block of assets you can work with. And the same with recreation centers. How can we open them up? Wellness is a very integrated concept, right? It's not just about active recreation and running around the track and being on a basketball league. It's, it's about your health. It's about uh, opportunities for access to services. And so the idea here is that not just thinking about how, you know, you could just go to summer camp. Little Johnny goes to summer camp. Can little Johnny go to summer camp and get a flu shot? Is that that hard? I can go to Target and get my eyes checked. Why can't I go and get a flu shot at the park? Because the park is probably where people need it and where people have easy access to it. And so it's this bigger picture on these integrated set of services that you can do as a park system through things like developer operator arrangements that help uh, pay the rent and pay for the capital and amortize that capital cost over the period of the term of that vendor is inside providing that service, expands the audience for parks, some parks uh, in, in parts of Chicago and other cities we work. People are turning away from those parks, one, because they are able to, or two, because they don't want to come over the threshold. There are lots of reasons why people might not walk in the front door. So if we can expand that set of services, think differently about what a park could offer, but still close enough to what its original core competency was, we can get there. And then not to forget these small parks, right? And that getting over the threshold for these small patches of parks is significant, and small parks, small parks are, are the economic stabilizers of neighborhoods. We did a study in Chicago of all 600 parks, the most extensive study of economic value, and looked at the influence of a park on property values within a two block radius of that park, controlling for confounding factors like a railroad or if it smells really bad from that factory and things that might depress property values. And what we found as a whole, parks in Chicago, all of them add one and a half percent to overall property values. That sounds like a small percentage, but it's a lot of cash that's added to the tax base. But small parks, together as an aggregate, whether there's a, a broken bench or an unmown, unmown lawn um, or a playground, small parks added 3.5% to property values. So there's something to that. And if we can think about that value, right, they're stabilizing and adding value, even in neighborhoods where no one else is bringing value or the market has turned away from and there's been cycles of disinvestment. So we need to take care for those small postage stamp places, not just the signature civic projects. And then lastly, of course, thinking about other objects in that street, how do you connect these civic assets and streets you hear about complete streets perhaps, like I can have a bike lane and I can have a car lane and I can have all these lanes. But streets also need to be a place to stop and a place for people to gather to meet their neighbors. How do you extend it, not just curb to curb, but wallpaper to wallpaper, or street front, storefront to storefront for a, an experience? We know that that also adds economic value. The longer people linger on a retail street, the more money they spend, the more likely you're to encounter your neighbor. You start to build those networks, those trust relationships, and that translates to the rest of your life, and your quality of life in particular. So I'm closing with a last set of ideas here, right? So. I had this image up earlier um, for a project that we're working on that's thinking very hard about the role of design and if it could do anything at all relative to reducing crime, which we turn on its head toward creating safe space. Um, we know that there are all these factors that have something to do with it. And so as we think about our asset, whether it's a library or a park field house, we start with what we have. We can assess, OK, if that's my public policy question, creating safe space, and these are the factors that from academics to researchers to our own work to everything we can figure out have an influence on moving the needle in a positive direction. 
What is that facility that I already own? As a collective, we own that library. What is it doing toward moving the needle on that public policy question? And then who else is in the neighborhood? What's the park doing? What's you know, the police station doing? How do we fill out that wheel, those wedges? And then those streets, how do we connect them? Back to that idea of friction. How do you make it as easy as possible for people to move in between the resources that they need? 10 minute walk, great. But how do you make it as easy and as safe as possible? Design has a role to play in that, but so does programming, so does testing, so does engagement. So connecting that network and then filling in the gaps block by block. And this way of thinking is something we're bringing to all of our urbanism work right now. And it's the idea that is not new. There's asset-based community development, ABCD, is, thinking, is assuming that there are assets in every neighborhood. And what we're saying is, in addition to that assumption, every block, there is something that the city can work with. I've got a sidewalk, I've got an alley, maybe I have a park building, maybe I have a vacant lot. There is something you can work with, and it's this, our theory that there's abundance on every block. And that, and as much as we talk about concentrations of poverty, there are also concentrations of opportunity. And so it's our job to find those, to do that mapping, to figure out the programming, and then the design that's the container for that program that supports it, to connect people with what they need, to move the needle on that policy question. And so as you think about what's facing Minneapolis and St. Paul and the questions you're trying to move on, I just offer up that the public realm has a role to play, whether it's parks or these other agencies, that the built environment we own in common and ought to leverage it for that benefit. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you. I think I go here now. I was a person in the front row coughing the whole time. I'm very sorry. But I actually can blame the public parks for it because three weeks ago, I went swimming in Lake Nokomis on that bizarrely warm day. We had to, like, it was 90 degrees one Sunday. So we biked from St. Paul to Lake Nokomis. I'm floating on my black back, completely blissful. And water comes over. Someone, some, I don't know, some rogue kayaker was really going at it. One of you guys? Swallowed yeah. water, went into my ear. I got an ear infection and a nose infection Ooh. and whatever. And it's still coming. So thanks a lot, Parks. You know. Anyway, they're dangerous Health for you. Wellness, I'm here to undercut it. the whole message. Anyway. Mm. Start off, how, how did you get into this? Oh, just tell us a little bit about who you are. Oh, um, let's see. We're interested. Okay. Uh, well... Uh, what did you study? Well, here you go. Yeah, yeah. here it goes. How about I, that? I applied to law schools and planning schools at the same time because I was really interested in public policy, right? Oh, and I okay. never wanted, no offense to lawyers, I never wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to have an influence on the laws and how we operate and interested in government. Um, and so I got into, I was living in Chicago and I got into law schools in New York and planning schools in the Midwest in Chicago. And at the time, uh, I was working at Uncle Julio's Hacienda and uh, Starbucks and uh, University of Illinois Chicago was a planning program that was also super economical. And so uh, my uh, husband and I were like, yeah, let's just stay here and I think you'll get what you need. And it turned out to be a great program um, in urban planning and, and policy and is one of those really great practice-based programs. If you're interested in that kind of range of international development and economics and transportation planning and community engagement, um, it's, a, it's so practice-based that you'd sit in a classroom with uh, community organizers who were like down in Chiapas, like working on like peace building. And then you'd have, you know, a developer's son who, you know, had every uh, door open for him that he needed to invest in buildings and was trying to figure out how best to do it. Um, and so it was a really great experience and practice base that they pushed you out into the world. And uh, through that, um, I ended up with a, uh, am I talking too long? Here? No, 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 okay. you're fine. No, this is great. I'm... I feel like should this be a couch maybe? No. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, so I ended up actually um, getting an internship initially with the city's department of planning. And that turned into a job in the way Chicago back in the day used to, where you'd show up at a meeting and someone would say, what do you want to do? And you'd say, but 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 and they'd say, no, no, you're going to there, to the mayor's office. And so that's how I ended up in the mayor's office. I was presenting something and got stopped halfway through and told to um, 
uh, show up for a different job on Monday in a good way. In a good way. Uh, but it was all that was that came out of working on um, some of Chicago's policies for um, both brownfields redevelopment and beautification. And part of it was asking big box retailers, for example, who at the time were coming into Chicago and just dropping these boxes that um, were really hurting communities and were also just from a design perspective, really unfriendly and making killing street life and that sort of thing. So how would you, what would you ask rules. them to do at that point? Well, first, uh, we did, uh, my job was due diligence. So mm-hmm. go find every suburb or as far as I could go or drive or research. Uh, this is almost, it's not quite pre-internet guys, but it's close. <laughs> um, um, and find examples where they were doing it the right way because of, they wanted to be in a suburb that had more restrictions and more design codes and that sort of thing. And so it was developing a whole portfolio where the mayor eventually put it in front of uh, big retailers and said, well, you know, you're willing to do this in Winnetka, but not in Chicago. Why not in Chicago? And so part of it was assembling the proof mm-hmm. and then developing um, the frameworks for an ordinance that uh, came to pass with the landscape ordinance, the streetscape ordinance, and things like okay. that. What would look? Be- what would work better? A couple of ginkgo trees, or was it? What was well, a it? lot of it was is uh, about scale, okay. and so you and blank walls, and you know you sort of drop in if if it's a, a CVS or you have a Target store. I mean, you've watched their design change a little bit over time, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, having all these blank walls, right, where you feel like uh, so all of a sudden you're walking down the block and then you're nowhere and you feel unsafe. Street trees and lighting, um, also in general aesthetics, the signage that it's pedestrian scaled um, where are your entrances that those kinds of things were part of it um, but you know at the time Mayor Daly had a, a, a significant beautification strategy too that was also about sort of showing that Chicago was healthy and those aesthetics actually they matter they had a influence on whether someone's you know looking at whether to invest and saying oh these medians are beautiful look at all these tulips Chicago's doing great <laughs> um, and so there's some of that but then there was also how could you, in a, a longitudinal way, make improvements in communities through things like streetscapes? Um, the median program was something that started uh, when I was there, and it was all about um, it, Chicago has all these had all these medians, and it was new at the time, and flower boxes and planters and stuff, and it was strategically done so you'd start through bookends. So you'd start in two separate ends of uh, a couple of neighborhoods and start moving toward each other. So you're setting up the expectations that it's coming. You're telling communities that have to wait that, look, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's some um, strategic things, I guess, that I learned in that process. What was your biggest accomplishment with when you worked for the city? Oh, gosh. Before you left. Um, Let's see. So I I spent a lot of time in the park district, as you said. Um, It's hard to pick one, but I would say there are, I guess... I'd say maybe there are two that I'm proud of. You can of, mention two. It's okay. Uh, one, I, I think, is getting some of these um, signature park projects done. Um, the Northerly Island, which was a 90-acre peninsula that was a small airport that the mayor shut down in the middle of the night without permission from the FAA by carving X's in the runway <laughs> and leaving planes there to be towed this is off. Daily. Like, this is Mayor yeah. Daly. Um, and then my job was to help pick up the pieces after that oh, fun. Uh, and do years of engagement and letting really people had real genuine rightful anger over the way it happened. And it was literally in the middle of the night uh, with spotlights on <laughs> that this happened. Um, and my job was to pick up the pieces and do engagement all around the city because it was a park for the whole city. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, there's it's in me, I think, having to be in every corner of Chicago and talk with folks from every every possible walk of life um, was such an incredible experience, not on just that project, but on many projects. So I guess that was part of the most what impactful for me. What would, what would people want differently? What would people, no matter what, I'm just kind of like, park, awesome! Uh, 80, fo- 80 foot tall statue of Sacagawea. Oh, okay. Uh, polo grounds, vineyard, okay. polo grounds. Uh, airport. Um, so there, yeah, I think mm-hmm. it was challenging as a site because uh, it was an airport for 50 years. Yeah, It's right on Chicago's lakefront. It's right next to the museums. Uh, and it was only for people who could afford to fly a small airplane, mm-hmm. who are also people who have lots of influence over things like politics and whether things happen. Um, and so part of it was, what does someone on the far west side care about this park, right? How do you help folks to connect to spaces that feel so far away? Um, and what, what, what pe- so what people needed to see were, I think, a convergence of ideas um, it wasn't something where you could put up three plans and everybody votes, but it was a matter of how could people see themselves, see it as an asset for them and the whole city. Um, and so it became a series of kind of 
parallel landscapes, a place for camping. You can actually camp in downtown Chicago. Um, and also, I think the other thing that I, I learned with that project that's significant is how do you leverage private sector to help finance what you need in the public sector, which we did through a concert venue there, um, which kicked off about a million bucks a year in revenue, a temporary venue on one end, that uh, once we, uh, once the economy had a downturn in 2008, and the Army Corps of Engineers, who funds Shoreline Projects, which is where this is, was knocking on every door. Hey, Milwaukee, do you have your local match for this project we want to do? Milwaukee says no. Hey, other cities, you got your local match? No. They knock on Chicago's door. Hey, we remember that project, Northern Island, all that planning. Yes, we've been keeping that money from our concert venue in a little <laughs> lockbox, and now we can do it. Um, and so I think there's a huge lesson on so many levels with that project. What was the other one? You said you had two. Oh, the other thing I think was, I told you you had permission to mention the other. Yeah, so for me, the other project I was really proud of was trying to bring some business intelligence to the parks business. Um, and in that, in such a way to say, you know, there, there are all these data sets about a city, right? And they're so flat. Like, where do children live? Where are their single parent households? Where is this and that? Um, and one of the projects that we did was trying to solve this problem of why weren't why did we have low enrollment in our park programs in particular parts of the city? And they were clustered. So, and I'm a planner, so I'm like, oh, let's make some maps. And so we're like, yeah, they're all clustered, uh, this kind of middle south and west part of the city. And we said, okay, well, uh, we could either bring in all the park supervisors and yell at them and say, mm -hmm. why aren't people in your parks? Or we could do more maps. So we did more maps. <laughs> and we're like, well, where are densities of children? Uh, high density, low density. Uh, where, are, where are our incomes? Low income, low income. Where is crime? High crime, high crime. Where is it, where's obesity rates? High, high. You start packing every, just about every single challenge. It was all on these small clusters of neighborhoods. It was just kind of a no brainer, but discovery. Mm -hmm. And so then we started mapping, well, where are kids going for programming? Because part of the challenge in Chicago is um, in the summertime, if you're not in a park program and you're not in any other program, in some communities, you're extremely vulnerable. And so we were interested in who were we missing? Where were those kids? How do you get them in? And so uh, we did this mapping and figured out uh, how to zero in on parks that were having the most trouble and did a whole uh, strategic planning process with folks uh, on the front lines in those parks to say, let's talk through what's, no, what's not happening here. We see these gaps. And what was really interesting was, uh, one, not only did our maps line up with every other city agency's maps. In fact, the police department was like, can we have your maps? Can we have our maps? So we can give you a copy of our maps. Can we have your maps? No. But um, we were seeing that there was overlap. The police had 15 impact zones, and they're all right on top of our areas. Mm -hmm. And so you could see these points of convergence as an opportunity. So I guess what I was proud of about that is we were able to make the low-hanging fruit discoveries, like brought in park supervisors, brought every person in the hole who could make a decision on something in a park in the same room. And uh, we'd have a park supervisor said, yeah, you know, um, I don't know why people aren't coming in, but... You know, I've been here 40 years, and, and so everybody speaks Spanish now. But I don't know why they're not coming in. I'm, I'm advertising with flyers and all that. We're like, that, I could fix that today. So we're like, fix that. But then we'd have um, other problems with uh, the park supervisor say, well, yeah, there's a, there's a gang line that runs down the middle of the park. The community center's on this side, and all the kids are on that side, and they actually can't cross to come over here. So now what? And that is not a problem that can get solved in a day. Um, but... It's the kind of thing where if you're not recognizing it exists, you can't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. And we also learned that um, the last thing I'd say, uh, we learned by digging deeper with uh, folks in those communities say, you know, why aren't folks coming in? And half the time it was because people did not want to write their name down. They didn't want to write their name on a sign-in sheet. They didn't want to have their name in the computer system or they, they couldn't afford to come in. And what we hadn't told folks that we never really advertise is if you can't afford it, you can come. It will let you in. It's free. Uh, it's not free if we can help it, but we yeah. will let you in if you need to. And you don't have to sign a paper. But we had to change things to make it possible. There are all these invisible barriers to access that you'd say, what, we have the program, I've got the staff, i got a beautiful building, but kids weren't coming in. Um, and so I think those kinds of discoveries uh, made a real difference. Um, and I wasn't lying. Other people can ask questions. So if you have a question, I don't know, are there people with microphones or not? Or are we just going to raise our hands and yell, oh, there are people with microphones. So if you have a question... Raise your hand, someone with a microphone will come, so you'll be, you'll, your voice will fill the auditorium. Otherwise, I'll just filibuster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Put me in Congress. <laughs> blah, blah. So, you talk to people a lot about parks. What, are, what do people want from parks? Uh, 
They want everything. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's not unjustified. I think the parks industry or people in parks are, they are so much on the front lines and parks are unlike any other level of government, I'll say, because it, you get a speeding ticket, you have to pay it, yeah. right? You need a building permit, you have to go and get your building permit, but nobody makes you go to a park. Yeah. So a park has to do more to get people in the door and to build those relationships. Um, you know, it, there's a model that the folks in Philly are working on, which is that park supervisors are community organizers, right? And that is a fundamental shift for so many who are used to a certain kind of delivery of services, but that's what they are. And when parks are getting it right, they're providing meals they're providing they're connecting people with the care that they need they're connecting people to jobs they're talking to the police like a, a great park is doing all of those things and raises the expectations that it should be doing those things um so and i think it, it depends also on you know on the community and, and community is such a thrown around word but it depends on at community at all levels you know at the the block level what's happening what's what are the needs what are the aspirations and then at the neighborhood level, and then citywide. So it, it varies across cities, in, in my experience. Do you think it's changed since you've gotten into parks? I mean, I, I was talking, we talked with, uh, I interviewed a man last spring about parks and about social media and whether people don't feel the need to be out in the community anymore. And you know, Are there more p kids staying indoors and connected? And how does the wired world affect people's connections to parks? I'm not completely convinced that it's all a disaster that people are on their screens. Um, I think that uh, smart park supervisors and park folks figure out ways to connect with people. Um, I don't want to offer up something as weird or maybe trite as like, you know, catching Pokemon outdoors. But there are <laughs> park systems that are intentionally placing those things there. And there are also there's also evidence of... You know, when people are on those screens, they also like to sit in a nice spot with yeah. shade and with sun. And so I think it's just um, people are adapting their use of the parks. Um, but I guess in terms of change over time, um, I just think there's more of a there's more of a need, I, particularly as um, services and funding is cut at the federal level. You're looking at the diminishment of either on the capital side, park systems haven't seen federal funds for construction projects since the uh, Urban Park and Restoration Act of like 2002. Um, there's a whole pot of oil and gas reserves that are intended to be spent on parks and that there's the, the mechanisms in Congress don't make it possible to actually spend those and get those out to cities and parks in the way they used to. And there's a huge emphasis on, um, there's not a huge emphasis, there's a lack of emphasis on urban park systems um, as suburban park systems tended to be the beneficiaries of the last mm. vestiges of federal funds. So my point is that the big a big change is that park systems have had to figure out how to make it work. So how do you get the lights on? How do you get partners in place to do things that are extra? And then I think the last shift that I've seen, which is an interesting one, is as many cities have developed these conservancy models, right? So what is the private-public partnership that's managing a space? Who does what? Uh, you look at a city like New York that kind of took it to the uh, nth degree where all their signature parks, Central Park and Battery Park and Bryant Park, they all have these conservancies that attract so much of the private funds. And in the meantime, the city's park budget has been diminishing and parks that don't have the kind of neighbors that can write a check or be part of an organized effort to make that park extra special or even mm -hmm. just run, that the parks on the margins were the ones that suffered. And you think about what I had said about those small parks, even with nothing in it, they still matter. Imagine if you made them great. And so I, th I think that's a shift as cities are now thinking like, how do you keep the public in the public-private partnership? What's giving away the store? I think there's more reflection now and that cities are saying, well, that's one model, but this is how we do it here because that works for everybody a little bit better. Um, the last thing I'll say, the big change is uh, community-based management models for open space that are not driven from a, for, uh, from a um, I guess, more professionalized, the, the less professionalized, more technical assistance groups that are out there now that are mm -hmm. helping communities to own and operate their parks, but providing that layer of um, technical assistance, of minimal capital investment, and just continuity. So when, you know, Mrs. Jones, who's been 
planning her, a garden in a vacant lot for 20 years, moves out of the neighborhood that somebody else takes over. Um, those kinds of groups that are building up, I think, are a really great example of some of the changes and the alternative ways of managing space. I think, do you actually have a question over there? Or where's, where's, hi, you got one. Hello, Destin. Okay. Um, so my question was, what was, um, who was your role model and what was your inspiration? Cool. Uh, great question. Um, I guess a couple of role models. Uh, my father was um, many things. He was a, a planner himself and an anthropologist and a fish farmer and uh, fish farmer, something where? else, yeah, in Holyoke, Massachusetts, really? right? Which was, uh, which is, it was an industrial town, um, and <laughs> it's there's a lot going on there. <laughs> and I had to work on a fish farm, uh, urban aquaculture. It's it's old, it's but it's back, new. Man. It's old, but it's new. It's um, thing. Yeah, but so he was also a small town mayor. He was a, a, a what they call a selectman uh, on the East Coast. And so from him, I learned um, the value of engagement. I learned that uh, because I used to go to community meetings with him and I'd just fall asleep under the table to like the hum. (laughs) A community meeting is like, it's like nice music. It's so comforting. Uh, No, I stay awake. But but his method, I think, of being genuine, authentic, um, and I think what he taught me was, you know, the most important thing you do at a meeting is stay after the meeting. Because there are so many people who don't feel comfortable in those sessions Hmm. that they won't say anything. They won't raise their hand. Someone like me has the mic the whole time. Talk, talk, talk. But they're, you know, people want to come up and tell you something. And even the people who are super mean at the microphone who are like, ah, Park's different, stinks, (laughs) you stink. Uh, they'll actually come up to you afterwards and say, hey, you know, I know I said all that, but here's what I really want to say. And so I think that's an, that's an important lesson I learned from my father, um, just about being accessible, being available, and, and your job never ends. I would say to, when I worked at the parks, I'd say, you know, on any given day, any one of three million people can call me. And sometimes they do. Uh, and I got to call them back and I got to handle it. Um, and that's part of the job, but it's also, um, is part of learning how to have real empathy, I think, for folks who are really trying to connect with a system that belongs to them. Well, how long, all right, with Polis Station, I mean, we saw the, the you did you have a, basically a community meeting that was set up? How long did it take for you to talk to people, gather people from the community until you came up with the idea of the basketball court? I mean, how, give us a sense of how many conversations, how um, many people you talked to? It was a long time, and I think um, we also did things in a different way. Like, we had a lot of dinners where we would invite folks um, to come dinner. We'd go to where people are and uh, and have these kind of informal sessions. So we did tons of one-on-one interviews. Just It was just months and months and months and months. And the fact is, um, we're still involved. You know, I just actually I got an email yesterday um, some of the community groups have been organizing a quality of life plan for the whole community and now they're ready for some more assistance and so uh, we're happy to come in. Um, but so it was, there was a period of time because it was an exhibition that we were working towards so there were about, certainly about eight months maybe worth mm-hmm. of that. Um, but I think that's the other, the other piece of it is um, the commitment to your own community where you're doing design work is that you need to remain accessible and you just have to um, think about how helpful it can be when folks, there's no way folks could hire us. Like, that was amazing. I know. Sort of thing. It just moved on its own. There's no way that folks could afford to um, hire us directly, but we have a commitment to where we live and that we ought to stay involved. And so, so we do. So it's almost hard for me to trace in my mind because we're still in conversations, even it's though still we happening. have that work. Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about some of the Pew Center statistics about people with less trust in each other and how they trust in Americans, but they have less trust in big institutions too. How does that affect your work when you're trying to get people to believe collectively all together and build a park or to partner with when you worked with the city and trying to get something done? Or build a presidential library in a park? Or, or build a presidential yeah. library in a park. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's true and I think people have good reasons to not trust institutions at the same time. We institutions need to work every day to build that back. Um, 
I mentioned the Presidential Library because it's a thing going on in Chicago. Um, the park that is always the top choice of any alien ship that wants to land in Chicago, Washington Park. Uh, 2016 Olympic bid. Where was the stadium going? There. With Lucas Museum. We, at one point, it was going to go there. Um, and I, so I think uh, the challenge there is that you have a couple of institutions. You have a university. You have the city. You have the park district. Um, and some have more credibility than others um, in not only listening well, but actually um, responding. And so I, I think it's just that is the work every day. And, and institutions that we work with all over the country, um, they're constantly having to work to build better relationships. Um, I, I, I don't have enough, I think, I have some good examples, but probably not enough, though, of institutions like universities and Element City government that are in a neighborhood and have genuinely positive relationships with their neighbors. Um, so it's I think it's just everyday work that needs to be done. What's your favorite park? Where do you go? Oh, for God's sakes. You knew I was going to ask that. I know. I know. Oh, you actually, must get asked that all the time. I don't think I've ever been asked. Uh, my favorite park, boy, that's like... Which is my favorite child? Oh, and I have two. You must have one you um, love more than the other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll never tell. Uh, let's see. Well, man, it's, isn't it funny that that would stump me? Because I am exposed to so many parks. Yeah. Uh, well, I think one of my favorite places, I guess, is uh, it was never called a park, but it was the town common where I grew up mm -hmm. uh, in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I never recognized that it was a park in the first place. It was called the Common, and it's where the fair was, and it's where you went uptown after school or when you're skipping class, which I never did. <laughs> uh, and it's where, you know, a farmer's market happened, and it was just, it never had to be defined uh, in a sp that I could tell in a specific way as like, this is the park and this is where you go. It was a very natural place to end up. There was a uh, a, kind of a wonderful casualness to its presence around. And it was also the place where um, very significant things happen, you know, major political demonstrations and um, people, you know, conflicts and everything that I remember happening on that common. So I think as an imprint, that was um, a pretty important place. I think the other, my favorite park is going to have to be Yellowstone yeah. National Park. And um, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, I know that the National Park Service is trying to do a lot of work on relevance, diversity, inclusion, and equity, and, and they need to keep working on it. Um, but those are just, you know, the, they really, you know, they're the cathedrals of this world. Um, and so it's, it's uh, I'm constantly impressed when I go into those big national parks and just, it, they take your breath away. Is there some other question? You got a question. Students know how to ask questions. Oh. Hello. Do what? I think it's on. Um, uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Hussein Ali, and uh, I'm a recent immigrant from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Welcome. And actually, this being involved with JAXA was my first job, and uh, I'm still involved, although I'm in college, back and forth. Um, as an uh, upcoming uh, designer and uh, hopefully an architect, um, what advice will you give me in starting sort of, you know, a Parks, you know, park foundation in uh, like from scratch, cause uh, um, the the idea came from uh, designing the park uh, up up terminal from scratch and you know dealing with all those number of years. So I back from my mind, I'm thinking of back home, cause back home they don't have some type of park. So what advice will you give me from that? So, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think I'd say th uh, think big and start small. Um, you know, I looked, if I look at that Bloomingdale Trail project with the big uh, spiral and trail, um, that really got organized by uh, a friend of mine who he and his neighbors were just looking at this need to turn this into this railroad into something that people could use. And they got organized by, they like, met it you know met in his mom's basement and like got some pizza and talked to each other and, and then like found other people who were interested in and then would have a sign at a bar and say hey are you interested and it's, it's sort of building a network slowly of interested people is a great place to start and then figuring out what are the skill sets in that group right like you're all sitting in this front row you all have 
different skills to bring to how you move something forward and how you can work on it. So there was this self-organizing piece that happened that with that project that I thought was really powerful and in projects that seem to have uh, longevity come from when uh, it's a grassroots kind of organizing. So there's the grassroots piece, but it's hard to do that without some technical assistance. And so I think it's also to look for organizations uh, in your community that are good at helping f people figure out the pathways to funding, the pathways to organization. How do you put a board together? Um, what do bylaws look like? So the structure of it. Um, my, my husband does a lot of work in, um, in Uganda with child soldiers and trying to help returning soldiers, um, and now uh, former combatants to get organized because people are constantly making decisions for them. So they have to get organized. And so what he does is provide this technical assistance of, okay, let's get you formally organized. Let's develop a network. Let's connect you kind of with the structures that, uh, you can be more powerful and, and have a seat at the table. Um, cause I, I like to say, and it's not my phrase, but if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so to the extent that we can get people with the most at stake at the table through a grassroots community organizing way, um, I think the more successful you'll be in the long haul. So Minneapolis already has, what, 97% of people within 10 minutes of a park? Yeah, it's I, pretty I good. checked this morning. On it's that. pretty good. <laughs> it's and pretty I mean, good. we've got a wonderful park system. We've got some inequities that still need to be solved, and we still have, we still need to finish up the river. But what what else do you think that we could be doing around here? Or what, what city should we be looking to for some inspiration mm -hmm. for some, you know, like just to add some more to our great city here? Yeah, well, I, I think Minneapolis St. Paul is doing really well with parks, and not just because Jane Miller is my friend <laughs> who runs uh, the park system. But I think the way that um, you're thinking about your natural assets, which I didn't talk much about, but you know, the whole ecology of a city, the, the civic ecology has people and some of these economic structures and these pieces, but the natural ecology um, and really figuring out how to get people to have a relationship with it is really important in order to get folks to value it, right, mm -hmm. um, and protect it and keep it maintained. Um, I, so I think Minneapolis is doing so much good in that way. And I particularly, um, I think it's, is it the pool project? There's like a, a natural mm -hmm. swimming yeah. pool. That's, I mean, that's great. I, I think Jane went all the way over to Copenhagen or something <laughs> to, our, to look at that. But I think, I think the knowledge around riparian edges and water systems um, I think it's valuable, and I think what Minneapolis should be doing is sharing that with other cities. Hmm. Um, you know, even if the ecology is a little bit different, uh, particularly along the Mississippi River. So, you know, you mentioned Memphis. We're working on a, a concept plan. It's for six miles of Mississippi River waterfront along downtown Memphis. Uh, and it's a waterfront that it might as well be a highway. Uh, folks kind of turn their back on it. It's a, it's a very wide stretch of the Mississippi. It's very fast. Uh, if you jumped out and swam in it, you'd end up in like the Gulf of Mexico in about two minutes. Um, and so what they, they have this whole segment of park system though, and it's right next to downtown and people don't feel like they have a relationship with it. And so I think um, sharing some of the lessons of how you build that back, even though the qualities of the trees and the connections are a little bit different, um, I think that's something Minneapolis could do. But you know, I, my my sense is though that like, like every city, um, our civic projects that we point to, that we want to talk about, uh, are, are easy wins to talk about. Not easy, but they're wins to talk about. I think the challenge is um, who's not at the table in those mm -hmm. conversations. And if we map our neighborhoods and we go beyond access and we start to think about services and needs and aspirations, how really are we doing? How are, how are we connecting with new, new arrivals? How are we connecting, um, particularly with youth, for example, here? I mean, you guys are an awesome program, um, but where are all your friends, right? There should be like a room full here. So I think it's figuring out how do we connect people and parks being the mechanism to do that. Um, so that's, pro that's probably a place to look in your own backyard. That sounds like great advice. Cool. Thank you so much, Jaya. Right. Thank you. I'm Dr. Andrew, I'll shake my hand. Gia, thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts. And Stephanie, always uh, wonderful to have you guide a conversation. Um, and Tatiana, Lanija, Sam, all of the Juxta kids, thank you so much for, for the work you do. You really are making our park system better, and, and we look forward to keep working with you uh, now and 
you know, way down the road. So thank you. Um, and each of you, thank you for coming. These are important conversations. Um, I will note we have an election that is coming up, and uh, there is the Minneapolis Parks Foundation partner with the League of Women Voters, the Trust for Public Land, uh, the Minneapolis Riverfront Partnership, and on our website there's a link, and on the League of Women Voters website there's a link of a questionnaire with survey for all of the people running for the park board. Please look at that. Those are both their answers are important, and the questions that are asked I think are important as to what really is going to lead to the, the maintaining this incredible park system. Um, Please keep in touch with us. Thank you for coming, each and every one of you, for, for uh, taking your time out. Uh, and as you head out, grab um, the, the flyer that Sam had mentioned. We have some materials. Uh, also, please consider making a donation to the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. We, we depend on individual support. Um, and just keep this story going. We look forward to keeping, uh, keeping up with you. Follow, as, you know, follow us on social media. Um, and we've got a lot more to do, so we're going to be asking everybody to help uh, make it even better. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and uh, have a great evening. Thanks.